Let's look at liquid-liquid miscibility again with um, a system that's showing a lower critical solution temperature behavior, and so it has an LCST down here. And so what's always beyond either um, above the, the, the minimum or the lower, um, or as in the other case, below the maximum or the upper critical, it's defining your two-phase region. So here's what's enclosed, and that's two phases. So if I were looking at a test tube that had um, of a, of a, any point in this two-phase region, I would have my total mixture, and there's my air mixture interface, meniscus, um, and below it would be two solutions. So I have here two densities two phases, two solutions. So that's what all of this is. All right. Um, so if you were to sort of um, shake them up, you would be sort of like oil and vinegar salad dressing. And when you let it settle, you would have a single meniscus that would define the two solutions um, a boundary between the two solutions, but the two solutions exist in here. Now, this is my equilibrium line, so that when I am, for example, heating, in this case heating, if I were to mix up a solution of this composition into uh, um, the test tube, pour the two liquids together in these ratios, I would actually have at the lower temperature a single phase and then as I heat it would phase separate at this critical temperature that's associated with this composition and once it's separated then I would carry on that vertical heating line but using tie lines defining um, the concentration or the composition rather of each of my solutions as I go forward or as I as I continue heating. Now we've looked at that on another video. What I specifically want to look at on this video alone is um, a path that moves from left to right or right to left as you wish. So I'm just going to do something simple like this. And I want to come out the other side and I want to go in this direction. So what is happening along that line? Again, I'm going to talk it out. You might want to take some notes because this is the kind of thing that you want to um, be able to explain. I don't want to say in your own words. I want you to be, I want you to digest it and understand it and just explain it back to me, but not not verbatim, okay, so you don't want to be memorizing what I say. Um, and the reason why I say don't put it in your own words, so to speak, is because we do have a precise vocabulary in thermodynamics and in physical chemistry, and the right, there is a right word for what you want to say, whether it is something like um, spontaneous or um, tendency, potential, meniscus, you know, there are very specific terms. So, uh, let's begin. My pointer. Um, so, to aid in any explanation that you give, it's a good idea, I think, to perhaps put some benchmark points so that you can stop and explain what's going on wherever you think it's appropriate. Um, I'm not going to clutter this diagram with it, but I may re refer to something like that as I'm speaking. So we'll start here, and at any point I drop a perpendicular to determine um, what the overall composition is in the whole mixture, whether it's phase separated or not. And so if I'm starting there, then I've mixed together um, a little bit of A and a little bit of B so that I get a composition of the mixture of this 
Okay, I'm not heating it, I am starting here. I'm, this whole thing is isothermal. Constant pressure and temperature, by the way. Um, so how do I move then from left to right? The temperature and the pressure are constant. Well, what's on your x-axis? Composition. So how do I change the composition? You're never removing a component. That's very difficult. So no SEP funnels. This is the test tube. Right, so you're going to add some A or you're going to add some B to change the composition. And since I have mole fraction of A on this x-axis, then if I'm moving from left to right, then basically what I'm doing, if I can illustrate here, moving across, I am adding, in fact, I am adding A a little bit and a little bit and a little bit of A into the test tube. And how is that affecting what's going on or is it affecting it at all? Add a little bit of A, I move to here. So my overall composition is richer in A. That makes sense because I just added some. But um, in this region, I have one phase. So if I look at my test tube, everything is in solution. I only have one meniscus separating the air from the solution. So everything is in solution. I've picked up that pen again. It doesn't work. There we go. One, one face, one solution. Um, so its volume is getting higher as I add more A, but it's not phase separating. And then I add enough A such that I reach this point. What happens at this point? Well, this point is on an equilibrium line between the one phase and the two phase region. So what happens here, moving in this direction, is that, <clears throat> sorry, my solution begins to phase separate. So let me just illustrate here. You get the appearance, and this happens at a micro scale before your eyes can pick it up, which is why we use the laser um, to pick up light scattering. So there's my mixture total, my solution until this point. And what happens is I get the appearance of a discontinuous phase and it starts and these domains sort of find each other and go if I let that settle on the inside of that two phase region I'm going to get two layers um, so here I have the onset of phase separation. Phase separation, not separization. That's a new word. Okay. So what does it phase separate into? Well, let's move inside the two-phase region a bit so that I can answer that without being on the equilibrium line. So let's stop here for a second. And what does it phase separate into? Well, I know that it's not phase separating into the two pure liquids A and B. I know that from the lab. And that's a common myth, by the way, people who don't think about this too much. <laughs> um, it is, in fact, separating into two solutions. And each of those solutions are liquids. Um, they, are, they are binary liquids themselves. What are their compositions? Ah, well, let's use the tie line. I'm here. I move this direction to get the composition of one, let's make this two layers. That's not looking good anymore. Let's do this. Okay, so there's the composition of one. And then I was at this point, right? My other tie line brings me to here. And this is the composition of the other. So that's the composition of one layer. This is the composition of the other layer. I'm going to keep adding more A. Move, 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 more A, more A, more A. And let's just stop here. What's changing? Still isothermal, isobaric, what's changing? 
I still have, I'm in my two-phase region, I still have two solutions, but what's changing is the composition of each of those solutions. Or is it? Well, let's see. I'm here. Where does my tie line bring me? Ah, same composition. This tie line. Still the same composition. How is that possible? That's why this is so cool. I'm adding more A, I'm adding more A, but what's moving is this meniscus, like the divide between the two solutions. So it's going to bounce around, and, but at any point when I let it settle, I have two solutions, and the composition of that solution is not changing, even though I'm adding more A, it's just distributing itself between those two existing solutions, so that at any point along here, it doesn't matter, that my tie lines are still bringing me back to the same intersections with my equilibrium line, and so the composition of the solution is the same. Each solution is the same, and therefore the densities of those two phase-separated solutions are the same. When I finally reach add enough A to reach this point, all of a sudden it goes clear again. This would be so cool to do in lab. I'll have to do that next year. Um, then what happens? Well, I'm in the one phase. I can keep adding A, and nothing apparently is going to happen, and my volume's just going to increase. So, I don't know, maybe you want to rewind that and take that in again, because it's, it's super cool.